Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Athena's Bible Study. I am Athena, and I'm coming to you from my home in Pegs, Oklahoma. And today, we're going to continue with the kings of Judah, and we're going to talk about Jehoshaphat the Brave. God blesses those who remain faithful to him. And our reading is going to be from 2 Chronicles 17, 19, and 20. All right. This lesson examines the reign of Jehoshaphat from 874 to 850 BC. He was a godly king of Judah who instituted important reforms and experienced God's miraculous intervention to protect his kingdom. This lesson presents traits of a godly leader encourages us to imitate those traits to remain loyal to God in the midst of troubles that test our faith and trust God for deliverance. All right, we are going to start out in 2 Chronicles 17 and we're going to read 1 through 19, which would be the entire chapter. Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. Jehoshaphat, his son succeeded him as king and strengthened himself against Israel. He stationed troops in all the fortified cities of Judah and put garrisons in Judah and in the towns of Ephraim that his father Asa had captured. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because in his early years he walked in the ways of his father David that his father David had followed. He did not consult the Baals but sought the God of his father and followed his commands rather than the practices of Israel. The Lord established the kingdom under his control, and all Judah brought gifts to Jehoshaphat, so that he had great wealth and honor. His heart was devoted to the ways of the Lord. Furthermore, he removed the high places and the Asherah poles from Judah. In the third year of his reign, he sent his officials ben Hel, Obadiah, Zechariah, Nathaniel, and Micah to teach in the towns of Judah. With them were certain Levites, Shemaiah, Nathaniah, Zebediah, Ashel, Shamaramoth, Jehonathan, Adonijah, Tobijah, and Tob Adonijah, and the priest Elishim. Elishama and Jeremiah or Jeroram Jeroram Jehoram These words are hard to pronounce. I don't know where they got these names, but most of them just look like they threw a bunch of letters together. I do apologize for mispronouncing more than likely a lot of those names. They taught throughout Judah, taking with them the book of the law of the Lord. They went around to all the towns of Judah and taught the people. The fear of the Lord fell on all the kingdoms of the land surrounding Judah, so that they did not make war with Jehoshaphat. Some Philistines brought Jehoshaphat gifts of silver as tribute, and the Arabs, 
brought him flocks, 7,700 rams and 7,700 goats. Jehoshaphat became more and more powerful. He built forts and store, city, and store cities in Judah and had large supplies in the towns of Judah. He also kept experienced fighting men in Jerusalem. Their enrollment by families were as follows. Oh, Lordy. From Judah, commanders of units of 1,000, Adonah, the commander, with 3,000 fighting men. Next, Jeho Jehonan, the commander, with 280,000. Next, Amasha, Amasa, Amasiah, son of Zikri, who volunteered himself for the service of the Lord with 200,000. And from Benjamin, Elida, Elida, the vid the valiant soldier with 200,000 men armed with bows and shields, and next Jehozabad with 180,000 men armed for battle. These were the men who served the king besides those he stationed in the fortified cities throughout Judah. All right. When Jehoshaphat became king of Judah, or when Jehoshaphat became king, the people of Judah had been for some time mixing their worship of the Lord with worship of false gods. Jehoshaphat set about immediately to bring the people of Judah back to the worship of the Lord only in obedience to his commandments. Jehoshaphat's first step was to destroy the high places where the people of Judah worshiped false gods. Next, Jehoshaphat sent out to teach people, representatives of the civil government, Levites who cared for the temple, and priests who represented the people before God. All of these taught the people of Judah the word of God, and that they should obey it. Jehoshaphat commanded the judges who served the people of Judah to serve God for the people justly and in righteousness. They were to warn the people to not warn the people to not sin and to encourage them to live for God. Jehoshaphat's reforms succeeded in freeing Judah of idolatrous practices. Jehoshaphat's reform exemplified a comprehensive method. Often our efforts are focused on evangelism to bring people to Christ. However, we must also be Devoted to teaching, dis disciplining people to live in the righteousness of Christ, to grow spiritually in their relationship with Christ, and to become established Christians who will please God. All right. Okay, we missed a whole section here. I'm sorry. Let's go to Jehoshaphat, or let's go to 19 and read 4 through 11. All right. Jehoshaphat lived in Jerusalem, and he went out again among the people from Beersheba to the hill country of Ephraim and turned them back to the Lord. The God of their fathers. He appointed judges in the land in each of the fortified cities of Judah. He told them, Consider carefully what you do, because you are not judging for man, but for the Lord, who is with you whenever you give a verdict. Now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Judge carefully, for with the Lord our God there is no injustice or partiality or bribery. In Jerusalem also Jehoshaphat appointed some of the Levites priests and head 
of Israelite families to administer the law of the Lord and to settle disputes. And they lived in Jerusalem. He gave them these orders. You must serve faithfully and wholeheartedly in the fear of the Lord. In every case that comes before you from your fa fellow countrymen who live in cities, whether bloodshed or other concerns of law, commands, decrees, or ordinances, you are to warn them not to sin against the Lord. Otherwise, his wrath will come on you and your brothers. Do this, and you will not sin. And Moriah, the chief priest, will be over you in any matter concerning the Lord. And Zebediah, son of Ishmael, the leader of the tribe of Judah, will be over you in any matter concerning the king. And the Levites will serve as officials before you and act with courage and men. May the Lord be with those who do well. Alright. So, hopefully that made a little bit more sense with what we read. Alright, we're going to jump over now to 20. Chapter 20. We're going to read 1 through 19. But first, I'm going to pause you for just a moment. Alright, I do apologize for that. Real quick pause. Um... My allergies are going nuts. All right, we're going to read Second Chronicles 20, 1 through 19. After this, the Moab, Moabites and the Amorites, with some of the Mennonites, came to make war on Jehoshaphat. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, A vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the sea. It is already in Hazazon, Tamar, that is, in Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat revolved, or resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came together from every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem and at the temple of the Lord in front of the courtyard and said, Where am I going down to? O Lord God of our fathers, are you not the God who is in heaven. You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. O oh, our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel, and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham your friend? They have lived in it and have built it in it a sanctuary for your name saying if calamity comes upon us whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress and you will bear us or you will hear us and save us but now here are men from Ammon Moab and Mount Seir whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt, so they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. All the men of Judah and their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. 
Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jeho uh, Jehiz Jezeel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jeel, the son of Mataniah, a Levite and descendant of Asphal, or Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. He said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz. And you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jerul. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance of the Lord will give you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out and face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Jehoshaphat bowed with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Then some Levites from the Kohathites and Korathites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. All right. In the time of Jehoshaphat, there were tribes living east of the Dead Sea who had been there for centuries. Principal among these are the Moab, Moabites and the Amorites, descendants of Lot, the nephew of Abraham. They saw the prosper, uh, prosperous kingdom of Judah as a prize worth taking. And with its goal in mind, they recruited a large army and advanced toward Jerusalem. When these enemies were a mere 50 miles from Jerusalem, the citizens were stricken with terror. Jehoshaphat immediately called the citizens of Jerusalem and Judah to prayer and proclaimed a fast throughout the land. The king led... By example, confessing aloud to God in prayer, neither, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Then came an answer from God through a prophesying Levite named Jezeel, assuring Judah that God would fight for them. And the people responded with enthusiastic gratitude, worship, and trust in God. If we follow Jehoshaphat's example and look to God for deliverance in times of trouble, it is likely that we too will receive a word of assurance from God. It may come by reading or recalling a scripture passage through a sermon, a song, or a word of prophecy. Or a still small voice speaking to our mind and heart. Lay hold of that word and trust God's promise. Alright, let's read twenty through verses twenty through thirty. Uh, okay, I'll just finish out this. Early in the morning they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat anointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army saying give thanks to the lord for his love endures forever as they began to sing and praise the lord and praise the lord set ambushes against the men of ammon and moab and mount seir 
who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The men of Ammon and Moab rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looks toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies laying on the ground. No one had escaped. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off their plunder, and they found among them a great amount of, quit of equipment and clothing, and also articles of value more than they could carry away. There was so much plunder that they took three days to collect it. On the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Baraka, where they praise the Lord. This is why it is called the Valley of Baraka to this day. Then, led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem, for the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. They entered Jerusalem and went to the temple of the Lord with harps and lutes and trumpets. The fear of God came upon the, all the kingdom of the countries when they heard about the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God had, come, had given him rest on every side. All right. Through the prophesying of Jezeel, God commanded the army of Judah to go out and meet the invading armies of the Moabites, Ammonites, Ammonites, and their allies. God told the people of Judah where they should meet the army advancing toward Jerusalem. However, God assured that the army of Judah assured the army of Judah that they would not have to fight the opposing army because he would give Judah the victory. The army of Judah obeyed the Lord and went to meet the enemy army with singers leading the way, praising the Lord. When they arrived at the place where they expected the encounter the enemy to encounter the enemy, the battle was over. The intended field of the intended field of battle was shrewd with the corpses of Judah's enemies. God had caused them to kill one another. After three days of carrying away the plunder, Judah celebrated their miraculous God-given victory and deliverance. Trusting and praising God for deliverance. The army of Judah went to meet their enemy. If you are facing a major spiritual battle, take time to praise the Lord for his blessing. If you are free from a major spiritual battle just now, pray that God will help you to meet the next challenge in your life with trust in him and with worship and praise to him. All right. Life-related learning. This one is titled, Blessed, Be Blessed Beyond Imagination. While living in the South more than 20 years ago, I went through a divorce. My life was turned upside down. My husband and I had been involved in Christian ministry until he decided it was time for a divorce and told me so. As you could imagine, I was angry. But I stayed in the church, worshipped with fellow believers, and listened to God preaching and teaching the word. This carried me through the time of crisis, and God provided me with a job doing medical transcription in, the, told, in the, a local hospital for my financial support. During a series of revival services, the evangelist prayed over me and gave me the assurance that my latter years would be more would be better than my former years. I wanted to believe this, 
but I could not see how God could make something good come of my life. I was closing in on 50 years of age and felt as though my life was nearly over. After some time had passed, I made a move to the Midwest to help my daughter and son-in-law care for their children. My son-in-law was attending seminary and never had enough time to help my daughter with their children, ages 7, 5, and 2. It was a joy for me to help tend my grandchildren, and I obtained another job doing medical transcription in a hospital. I was content, and the Lord had additional good plans for my life. In 2006, God brought a godly man into my life, and seven months later, we were married. God led us to a large church in our area. After this, I was able to obey God in fulfilling his calling for my life by becoming an ordained minister. Both my husband and I now serve as deacons in our local church. We are part of a group called His, Extended, his Hands Extended, who do nursing home ministry, and through our church's counseling center, I also engage in ministry of counseling. There was a dark time in my life when I could not imagine my life could be what it is today. I am blessed of God beyond anything I have the ability to think or ask of Him. When we seek first God's kingdom and righteousness, He gives to us according to our need. Written by Mrs. Linda Kruger. All right. The readings for today. Deuteronomy 29, 2 through 9. That's one you can do on your own. Apparently the cat's going to make a bed on my Bible. I will go ahead and read the, instead of reading the Bible verses, I'll just read the commentary to them. Deuteronomy 29, 2 through 9. God's convention, God's convenient covenant, say the right word, with Israel required that they remain faithful to God to receive the benefits of the covenant. There would be, there would never be the possibility that God could be unfaithful to Israel, but Israel would have to be attentive at all times to maintain their faithfulness to God. The same principles apply to those of us who live under the covenant of grace by faith in Christ. Alright. That was Deuteronomy 29, 2 through 9. It's the one you need to read for that one. Alright. Number 2. Joshua 1, 1 through 19. Joshua 1, 1 through 9. Or, no, I'm sorry. 1 through 9. Joshua 1, 1 through 9. All right. God assured Joshua that he would be defeated or undefeated by any enemy in Israel's conquest of Canaan by standing courageously in faithfulness to God by believing and relying on God's word. Joshua gained strength and courage to faithfully serve God. We too by believing and depending on God's word, gain spiritual strength and courage of faithful service to God. That was Joshua 1, 1 through 9. Psalms 3, 1 through 8. Psalms 3, 1 through 8. David trusted God in his times of adversary, and God never disappointed him. David had a reputation as a mighty warrior, but he knew and often acknowledged that his victories were because God fought for him and for his people, Israel. As Christians, we are not alone in our battles. God still fights for his people, and he still gives victories to those who trust in him. All right, that one there was from Psalms 3, 1 through 8. Zechariah 8, 1 through 8. Zechariah 8. 1 through 8. Situations that seem to us impossible are not impossible for God. 
when a remnant of Jews returned to Jerusalem after their Babylonian captivity, the challenges of rebuilding Jerusalem, the temple, and their nation seemed overwhelming. But God promised them success if they would serve and trust him. Deliverance from the impossible comes by serving and trusting in God. And that one there came from Zechariah 8, 1 through 8. Luke 12, 22 through 31. Luke 12, 22 through 31. One of God's identifying names is Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. Another identifying name of God is El Roy, or God who sees me. Jesus' teachings assures us that God not only sees us, and sees our needs, he will also provide for our needs as we trust in him. Instead of being anxious about our needs, let us focus on God's ability as our provider. That was Luke 12, 22 through 31. Philipp uh, Philippians 4, 6 through 13. Philippians 4, 6 through through 13. The Apostle Paul testified of the contentment or sufficiency he found in simply trusting God to supply his every need. Paul said he had learned in whatever condition of life he found himself to be content or sufficient because he could do all things through Christ who gave him strength we can and should live with the same confidence in God's faithfulness. Philippians 4, 6 through 13 is where that one there comes from. I hope you guys read those to understand what the commentary here means about them. Um, and that, my friends, is what I have for you guys today. I hope you guys enjoyed the lesson i hope you guys got something out of the lesson uh tomorrow is sunday so i will have my children's ministry tomorrow and then monday i have therapy so tuesday i will be back with joash the young and we will continue in Second Chronicles because they, I guess, Second Chronicles is where all the recording of the kings of Judah are. So, with that, my name is Athena. This is Athena's Bible Study. I'm coming to you from my home in Pegs, Oklahoma, and I hope everybody has a wonderfully blessed day. See you guys next time.